We've looked at the basic structure of the kidney. We've looked at the basic unit of the kidney, which is the nephron. And we've looked at the ultrafiltration that takes place inside the um, Bowman's capsule and the, and the glomerular filtrate that goes into it from the glomerulus. We've looked at the absorption through the proximal convoluted tube and of course the absorption through the loop of Henle. Now we move on to the bit which is the fine detail in terms of the osmoregulatory part of the nephron. So this is the part responds to the conditions of the body. This is the homeostatic control mechanism. It takes place in the distal convoluted tube and the collecting ducts. It's under the influence of a hormone called antidiuretic hormone. A diuretic is something that makes you go to the toilet, makes you go for a wee, makes you produce more urine. And natural examples of that that you will come across in your everyday life are things like caffeine, which has a dehydrating effect because it's helping you to draw water out of your body and put it into the urine. And also alcohol. Alcohol does exactly that and um, it's compounded the problem because normally when people are drinking alcohol, they then go on to forget to drink some water. So when they wake up in the morning, they have a massive hangover. So clearly antidiuretics are something that stops you making that urine and helps you to keep the water inside your blood plasma to keep its water potential high, in other words, to reduce the effect of solutes in that blood plasma. So this antidiuretic hormone, we can write that as a D, H. And it's actually secreted by, guess, the pituitary gland, which is considered our master gland inside the brain. It's under the control, however, of the hypothalamus. Remembering, of course, of course that the hypothalamus and the pituitary work together. Looking at that relationship, and what we've got is our neurons, our neurosecretory neurons hanging out like this in the pituitary gland and they actually store the hormone there ready for its release. So this is unusual, we've not seen it before. What we're talking about is a neuron that's secreting something directly into the blood. It gives it a neurosecretory role. So if the blood capillary was going past there as it's released into the blood and off it goes. So let's consider the trigger for this antidiuretic hormone. So let's just think about the word antidiuretic. A diuretic is something that makes you go to the toilet. So an antidiuretic is something that stops you from going to the toilet. Why would you want to do that? Because you're thirsty, because your blood solute level has increased to, and it's made your water potential decrease to a level that your cells in your hypothalamus, your osmoreceptor cells, have noticed. And the reason why we think that they notice this decrease in water potential, the increase in solute concentration and the desire to keep water is because we think that as the blood passes through these, water moves out by osmosis and they begin to shrink. That then communicates with this cell. This cell sends a message down here to release the hormone, antidiuretic hormone into the blood. Okay, so that's going to travel now, basically, we're going to talk about it a little bit more, but it's going to travel to the kidneys and it's going to stop it from making uh, watery urine, if you like, urine that has a high water potential. Okay, so let's create a flow chart for where we are so far. Okay, so we need to also remember that our distal convoluted tubule is surrounded by those blood capillaries because it's the blood capillaries that reabsorb the water, take it away. And of course that reabsorption only goes on because we've got a diffusion gradient. So it's important to keep that in mind. So, so far what have we said? We've said that imagine you get thirsty. In other words, your solute concentration increases, which means your water potential of your blood decreases. 
How is it detected? It's detected in the osmoregulatory centre of the hypothalamus. The cells begin to shrink because water moves out. That sends a message to your neurosecretory cells which connect your hypothalamus and your pituitary and the terminal ends of those bulbs which are storing the ADH release it into the blood capillary. That hormone, antidiuretic hormone, then travels all over the body and it will end up in the blood here and it's going to cause an impact on this distal convoluted tubule. So let's look at a little area there, let's draw a diagram here so we can look at it in more detail. Okay, so in this diagram here we're looking at a really small bit here and of course this um, blue triangle bit is my antidiuretic hormone which has been released from the pituitary gland. It's travelling all over the body but of course it will only cause an effect here because this is where the shape, remember we talk about a hormone, it's a protein so its shape is complementary to its receptor. So I'm just going to draw the receptor in blue also. That's sticking on there. Again, it would be full of receptors but I'm just keeping it really simple by drawing those. That's going to fit into there, so the antidiuretic hormone is going to fit into that glycoprotein receptor there. And that then causes a change, an activation of one of the enzymes inside the cell. And that enzyme is called phosphorylase. Now this is where it gets really cool because inside these vesicles are some protein channels which are passages for water and they are called aqua porins, aqua obviously being water and porins, if something's porous it means it allows water to pass through it. Now the phosphorylase, the enzyme inside these cells that is activated as a result of this complementary binding here causes these fusicles first of all to move and then to fuse with the membrane on this side. So those vesicles move they fuse and they increase the amount of water that can, can then be absorbed into, first of all here, and then of course, by osmosis into there. Remembering that of course it was um, the low water potential, the high solute concentration of this blood that triggered the whole process off in the first place. Let's now continue with that flow chart. Now the bit that Francesca doesn't tell you about is the effect of ADH, antidiuretic hormone, on this collecting duct. As well as increasing the permeability here to water, it increases the permeability here to urea. Of course, we've just absorbed a lot of water into here, so we've reduced the water potential of the, of the urine itself. So the relative concentration of urea in here is high. So by ADH increasing the permeability here, what's going to happen is urea is going to diffuse out into the interstitial space. So what do we think will happen next? Of course, water will follow. And because water is pulled out of the tube into the interstitial space, it will continue to move by osmosis into those blood capillaries that surround it. So the combined effect of the um, increased permeability of the collecting duct to urea and the increased permeability of the distal convoluted tubule to water help to reabsorb as much water back into the circulatory system as possible. Now, of course, you're also going to be driven to feel thirsty and to go and seek a drink because all you're doing is actually reabsorbing the water that was in your blood already. You're just reducing the amount that you lose. You're not actually increasing it at all. But what will happen is you'll feel thirsty and you'll seek a drink.
So you've reabsorbed as much water as you can back into your circulatory system. What happens next? Well, your brain detects the increase in water potential because those cells in the osmoregulatory center of the hypothalamus suddenly start to absorb water again by osmosis and they're not so shrunken. So these cells absorb water by osmosis and they're not quite so shrunken. So of course if our osmoreceptor cells aren't as shrunk, they're not stimulating these neurosecretory neurons as much, which means that they release less impulses down here, which means that they release less ADH. Well, what impact does that have on the distal convoluted tubule? Well, these aquaporins that did exist are now taken out as the cell membrane invaginates and recreates a vesicle. And the vesicles reform ready for an increase in ADH. So do you really know this topic? Could you construct the flowchart by yourself? Could you construct the flow chart backwards? In other words, imagine you've drank too much water, you've got an excess of water and you need to lose it. Could you do the whole thing all the way through with as many steps as possible? Can you answer these questions? Imagine that you've done some vigorous exercise. Would that cause more ADH to be released or less? Imagine that you've had a day out at the seaside, you haven't had anything to drink and you're dehydrated. Is that more ADH or less? Imagine that you've just drank a litre of water. Would that cause more ADH or less? Imagine that you 